Good evening. Welcome to North Beat. I'm Megan Roberts. A respected Yukon elder has died. Percy Henry was a former chief of the Trondek Quechan First Nation, a teacher of the Han language, and a recipient of the Order of Yukon. He died this past Saturday in Dawson City. Keechan Pilkington tells us about his legacy. It's believed that he was born in 1927. Over the course of his storied career, he worked in a sawmill as a ferry captain and on the land. As chief of Trondequichin First Nation, he helped deliver Together Today for Our Children Tomorrow to Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau in 1973. Later in his life, he was known for his work promoting Indigenous languages, especially Han. He was an active advocate, teacher, and friend to the very end. Georgette McLeod, an oral historian, gathered dozens of hours of tape with Henry. She says he always worked tirelessly to serve his community. He, he was a fountain of information and knowledge when it came to knowing his, his country. He was so rich in his stories, uh, in his humor and his laughter and all of his uh, amazing experiences. Gerald Isaac was a close friend. He was uh, 97 years old, and, and during all those uh, periods of times, the contribution is innumerable, and, uh, and the uh, consequences uh, will be felt for a long time to come. And uh, to instill the preservation of the language and the custom and the culture of our people uh, is uh, still very much alive as a result of his efforts. He says while this loss will deeply impact many in the Yukon, his legacy will live on. My grandfather, my chief, my friend, you have good rest. Now you will be go home to our creator. Thank you. In Whitehorse, I'm Katrin Pilkington. Wildfire season is fast approaching. Last year, it was brutal in the Northwest Territories. Communities were devastated, homes were lost, and there were mass evacuations. And among those who left were the media. All CBC North staff were told to leave evacuation zones if they wanted to work, and most other media organizations worked remotely as well. But what does that mean for the public? And with fire season weeks away, should more reporters be on the ground during an evacuation? The CBC's Luke Carroll has been looking into the benefits and the risks of reporting from evacuation zones. Luke, you and I both left last year. Why did media kind of in the broader sense leave during the evacuations? So I started looking into this uh, connected to kind of our own coverage and I thought it was because there was a legal imperative for us to leave. But I learned, and, and I'll get into this shortly, that that's not actually clear. So according to Sherelle Tobin, the director of journalism for CBC British Columbia, journalists have a presumptive right to be in an evacuation zone. And this is across Canada. We have the right to be there and to report in the public interest. And that is our position. Um, and that is the position that we advocate for greater access um, because it's in the public interest. We consider the safety of our journalists our responsibility at the CBC, not the responsibility of the emergency officials. Now, CBC North didn't allow reporters to stay in any evacuation zone to report last year. Uh, managers chose to abide by the evacuation orders. And they weren't alone in that decision. Ollie Williams is the editor at Cabin Radio, and he also left Yellowknife, and as did uh, his reporters. So why did Ollie choose to leave? So Ollie, th their coverage was widely praised um, for their, their live blog that was throughout the evacuation. And he says he doesn't think that the coverage uh, or its value would have really changed from being in Yellowknife. Very, very little of our most important coverage last summer involved being there. The most important stuff we did, as far as I can tell from the feedback from our audience, was help me understand, is the evacuation going to be safe? What's happening in the stretch of highway ahead of me? Help me understand where I can stay. Now, he says there are situations where he thinks journalists do need to be in a dangerous setting like an evacuation zone, but he says he personally would never put a reporter there unless they are properly trained and prepared to do so. So you'd mentioned that question of a legal imperative before. Is there anything legally preventing media from reporting during an evacuation in Yellowknife? 
So I still don't have a clear answer to that. Um, I, I asked the territorial government for an interview on the subject that was declined, uh, but they did send an email response um, saying that who stays is really determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Although typically it's, it's the municipality who's gonna be ordering the evacuation. Uh, that didn't happen with Yellowknife, it was actually the territorial government. Um, so essential workers were allowed to stay here, uh, though, though there is no definition in the Emergency Management Act of what exactly an essential worker is, Megan. So what are the benefits then of staying and reporting in an evacuation zone? So the big thing I've been hearing is around accountability and just access to the stories that media can get from being there. It forces the media to be less reliant on the information that the government decides the public is entitled to. So one person I spoke to was Jesse Winter. He's an award-winning photojournalist based in BC. Uh, now he had the unique experience of being able to embed with the BC Wildfire Service. So not only was he covering areas under an evacuation order, but he was covering the firefighting efforts from the front line. So he talks about how the media getting more access can help the public understand what's happening and make critical life and death decisions. But we're seeing a rise in evacuation hesitancy. We're seeing people you know, thinking they understand what's happening and then using that to make decisions about whether they stay or go, whether they, you know, try and fight a fire themselves. And while I think there are, there are ways in which we could be doing a better job to mobilize local resources to manage fire, the first thing we need to do is to be able to understand what's happening. And the, in order for the public to trust that information, it needs to come from an independent source. In Yellowknife, there were lots of concerns around things like looting. Uh, so you can imagine how reporting on the realities of that would help with public trust or being able to report on what's going on at the hospital or the airport, uh, showing progress with the fire breaks. There's all kinds of stories that you just can't cover in the same way from afar. Okay, so evacuation zones are evacuation zones for a reason, though. There is that question of safety. So how do you balance all of that with safety? Yeah, so to Jesse Winter, it's all about training and preparation. Um, so he's received enough training to actually basically be qualified to work as a contractor on a fire line. Um, if you're a photographer who just shows up to a firefighting effort with no training, you could put those firefighters in danger. Uh, from what I've heard, there's a lot of training that is offered in other jurisdictions for media covering wildfires. So I wanted to know what is available here, uh, specifically CBC as the largest media outlet in the north. Um, and CBC's director of journalism sent me a link to a one-day course called Domestic News Safety. Um, it should be mentioned, I didn't see anything in the description that mentioned wildfires. Uh, but the other thing that Winter has to say is that there just needs to be communication. Firefighters and governments and journalists need to talk to one another to understand what needs to be done for journalists to cover the scene safely. Uh, I reached out to the territorial government to ask about this consideration. And a spokesperson said uh, in an unsigned email that they weren't opposed to the media embedding with firefighters, but it would depend on the officer in charge and they would need to have the proper safety gear and training to do so, Megan. Okay, thanks for looking into this, Luke. Thanks, Megan. After 124 years, the White Horse Star will publish its final edition next month. The paper is one of the last independent newspapers in Canada. The editor of the White Horse Star says negotiations with an interested party failed to keep the newspaper in business. Jim Butler has been with the Star for more than 40 years, and in that time, the paper's business model has collapsed. He explains why. Social media have been devouring newspaper revenue sources like some sort of crazed Pac-Man on the loose in 1982. It was us last week, it'll be someone else next week. I'm not divulging any secrets when I say our full-page ads by major local and national businesses had a devastating drop-off in recent years. Most of our flyers are gone, classified ads 99% eliminated, our lucrative real estate supplement gone, very significant fall-offs in Yukon government and city of Whitehorse print advertising lineage, legal ads gone, e even birth and marriage announcements are non-existent in local newspapers. And I won't even get into the problems of trying to recruit staff with today's housing predicament in Whitehorse not to mention competing against public sector salaries. So, so confronted with this, this perfect storm of challenges, it makes for a very grim operating environment for a newspaper indeed. Well, it's been a surreal few days. Uh, last Thursday evening, I laid out a few news pages for the Friday edition while alone in the building, tinkered with the announcement we ran on page three about uh, ceasing operations. 
I went home, filled the bird feeders, fed the cat, walked to a lookout um, above the Bikini River Valley and rationalized that uh, despite the very grim ending of my 43 years with this marvelous enterprise, the river will continue to flow and uh, life will go on. So there you have it. Butler says losing the star means fewer reporters covering institutions like government and the courts. He also says Yukoners have grown up seeing themselves in the paper's photographs. The last edition of the White Horse Star will be on May 17th. An economist painted a bleak picture today of what the Northwest Territories and the city of Yellowknife will look like after the diamond mines shut down. The mines have been the engine of the NWT economy for three decades, but they're projected to close in about six years, and there's nothing new on the horizon. I am not Chicken Little. I do not believe that the sky is falling. But if I could say quite bluntly, um, if in the next six to eight years, if we could, we, we potentially <coughs> lose... Um, the production, we lose the jobs, we lose the business activity, we lose the retail sales, and we lose the residents. Um, and, you know, the sad truth is I didn't come here today with a solution. Clinton made the remarks at a Yellowknife City Council meeting this afternoon. He says the closure of the mines will cause the NWT population to shrink by about 1,100 people. That decline would cause a reduction in federal funding. The NWT government's tax revenues would also decrease. Altogether, Clinton estimates that would result in a $105 million hit to the territorial government's revenues. Clinton's report is available on the City of Yellowknife's website. The Animal Protection and Control Act is now in effect in the Yukon, which means the territorial government can prosecute people who are inhumane towards animals. That includes debarking dogs or declawing cats. And if a vet suspects animal abuse, they can flag the problem to the Yukon government. Owners are also required to control their animals in public, including aggressive dogs. Yukon's chief veterinary officer says the territorial government will work with communities to come up with enforcement plans. When we receive a complaint, there the officer takes information from the person who's complained. Often if the owner of the animal is identified, the officer will follow up with the owner of the animal and the accused and gather information from them about the circumstances. Um, and then they will typically proceed to a visit with the person who's been accused and have that conversation in person. The law affects all animals defined as vertebrates. Some animals, including certain insects like spiders, are also covered. Over the years, wild pigs have escaped from farms in the Yukon. The law addresses that as well. The government can now eliminate the Eurasian boar if it poses a threat to the environment. The Liberal government has pledged billions of dollars to modernize Canada's military with a focus on bolstering Arctic sovereignty. It's a response to heightened tensions arising from the war in Ukraine, and it'll include new submarines, long-range missiles, and early warning aircraft. Murray Brewster has the details. Canada's military is due for an upgrade, and Ottawa says it's ready to spend billions to do it. Today, we are announcing our next commitment to our armed forces and to Canadians' security. It makes 73 billion dollars worth of investments over the next 20 years. Much of that investment comes down the road. In the short term, roughly 8.1 billion dollars will be invested over the next five years with emphasis on the Arctic. This new strategy, the result of a long-awaited defense review ordered two years ago after Russia invaded Ukraine. Ukrainian cities and infrastructure have been pounded by Russian missiles. To guard against that, Canada will invest in early warning airborne surveillance planes. Canada also hopes to purchase a tactical missile system similar to what the U.S. has given Ukraine. Another priority, submarines, to replace the nearly 40-year-old Victoria-class boats. The Prime Minister suggested it is not a question of if the Navy will get them, but when and how many. But we also know there is more to do. 
For example, we talk about uh, exploring and defining the submarine capabilities we're going to need to patrol and protect our Arctic in the coming decades. Canada has been under pressure from allies to increase defence spending to meet NATO's target of 2% of GDP. This plan only gets the country to 1.76% by 2029. And that is if everything goes OK, according to this defence expert. It's like most of our policy documents, it's a statement of intent. And I think it'll very much have to be checked against delivery. I think the implementation of our defence policies has, in my opinion, been the real struggle. Other experts agree and say Canada's business-as-usual approach, such as taking two years to rewrite the defence strategy, won't work anymore. And in light of Ukraine, the government will have to deliver on the commitments and swiftly. Murray Brewster, CBC News, Ottawa. Today in Yellowknife, the Minister of Northern Affairs talked about what all this defence spending means for the North. Dan Mandel says there will be northern operational support hubs. They'll consist of airstrips, logistics and stockpiles of essential parts. He says there will also be multi-use spaces. Mandel says northerners will have input on how they're constructed and that the end goal is to keep people safe. We know that the Arctic is a strategic location uh, for the world now. Uh, we know that the geopolitical political situation has changed. We know that climate change is going to make it more accessible. Uh, but having said that, it's essential that we consult with the people who live here. Uh, so we have to keep people safe while at the same time respecting uh, people's, uh, uh, people's, uh, people's input for their communities, uh, but at the same time making, ensuring that uh, Canadians are safe uh, in the Arctic and all over Canada. Vendel didn't give any specifics on when, where or how the support hubs and multi-use facilities will be built. He also didn't indicate how much of the $73 billion will be spent on northern defence. King Priya doesn't love exercising, but loves the way it makes her feel. Max doesn't love cooking, but loves homemade meals with his kids. Paul doesn't love doing his taxes, but loves getting the benefits and credits he qualified for. Learn more about benefits and credits like the GST, HST credit and Canada Workers Benefit at Canada.ca slash every dollar counts. A message from the Government of Canada. What does it take to reach the top? Join me, Ian Hanamanzing, as I get to know some truly inspirational people <laughs> who share the secrets of their success. If you want to talk about one moment? It's a moment where I would live or die. It changed everything on CBC News Explore. Sipping on a bit of Henny. Can I get a little Remy? Feeling heavy. Chilling, but I'm feeling ready. Pulled up in a big old Chevy. This year's Whale Cove snowmobile race was a huge success. It was fast, it was exciting, and as TJ Deer reports, it is revving up in popularity. 13 racers hit the trails last year for the return of the Whale Cove snowmobile race. It was the first time the race was held since 1982. This year, 31 racers registered to compete for the event. Nico Tautongi is one of the organizers. He said this second year back was a big success. I feel like the race turned out to be an amazing event and an amazing day and amazing weather. The 160-kilometer track goes between Rankin Inlet and Whale Cove, with multiple pit stops before returning to Rankin Inlet. Race Marshal Stanley Adjuk says the pit stops were exciting for Whale Cove residents. It brings out the whole community outdoors and enjoy the whole five minutes at least, the most, watching the racers come in, gas up and take off. Taina Ashuna led the fundraising efforts for the race. She said it was much tougher a year ago when they brought the race back. Last year was our first year ever. It was within like two weeks that we had to come up with funds to pay out the racers. 
Ashuna says racers came from all over Nunavut, and one traveled all the way from Toronto. It brought back memories for everyone, including 83-year-old Paul Kablutschek, a retired racer from Avviat. He remembers the joy the event brings and how times have changed. Back in the day, we had tougher machines, and we would file the parts down on the engine to make it go faster. We were fast dudes. It was great. The winner of this year's race was Nanauk Tanuyak, with a time of 1 hour, 21 minutes and 1 second, taking home $15,000. TJ Deer, CBC News, Iqaluit. Iqaluit's springtime festival is in full swing, and it's not just Iqaluit who are enjoying the event. 123GO helped organize the festival, and its president says people come to participate in tunic time from across the north and around the world. Festivities that we, we've been having during, during our uh, 59th year of tunic time, and uh, I'm very glad to have Inuit, Hadlunak, anybody coming here from anywhere around the world and enjoying the outdoors of springtime here. The festival combines traditional competitions with modern events. This year's schedule includes dog sled races, golf, and a craft fair. This year's honorary tunics are Jacob Usitiglik and Adam Lightstone. Uh, it's incredible to have the two very community-driven individuals recognized. It's uh, something we always look forward to, to seeing, but also celebrating. Uh, all year round, they give themselves to the community that we're very fortunate to call home. Uh, so I was very honored to see the two individuals uh, recognize. The festival continues throughout the week with closing ceremonies on Sunday. And in Inuvik, the 66th Muskrat Jamboree is wrapping up today. The event is all about gathering together and laughing with one another. The CBC's Des Lorene went to check out the games this weekend. The Jamboree draws hundreds of people to the river ice, showing off their culture. I've been taking part in all of the games so far, but I think my favorite part of the Muskrat Jamboree weekend is just the fact that uh, this event brings all the community members together and com uh, people from other communities as well. And also showing off their grit. Jonathan Amos has been coming to the Jamboree his whole life, and now he's the voice of the event. Favorite event would have to be the jigging contest for myself, um, but just to watch the other events happen, uh, snowshoe races, uh, events here down at the river, it, it's all a big part in my, my life. His father, Jeffrey Amos, has been a longtime volunteer. Well, I think we, it's, it's, we all grew up, uh, you know, snowshoeing, running dogs, that kind of stuff. So I also coach uh, snowshoeing, how to win the games. Yeah, it's good to see kids come out race. A new big celebration of culture and community ends tonight with a skidoo race. Des Lorene, CBC News, Inuvik. Well, it wasn't much of a show in the north, but sure enough, the moon did eclipse the sun today just a little bit. Above Yellowknife, beyond the cloud cover, 11% of the sun was covered by the moon. It was hard to see. It did happen. Down south, though, it was a much different story, a spectacular and rare total solar eclipse. Anand Ram has that story. This breathtaking dying of the light captivated people across the entire continent. Early birds crawling in traffic just to get a good spot. I'm trying to have a, a celestial experience, you know? I'm trying to something to touch my soul. We have some uh, badminton sets in the back, some, uh, what do we buy? Pickleball. Pickleball. Crowds gathered across the eclipse's path from Mexico to the motor speedway in Indianapolis to the mists of Niagara Falls all for a few minutes of darkness in daytime. It's one of the great natural wonders of the world, one of the great celestial events of the universe, same place, same time, once in a lifetime. And though the clouds over the falls dampened the look of totality, the sound, a crowd still awestruck. It was really cool because like you knew it was just like the mid afternoon, but then it felt like it was like eight o'clock at night because it was so dark and it was like colder. <laughs> In Mont-Mégantic, Quebec, 
As darkness descended, spirits lifted. I feel special because we've, we've been driving for six hours to get here. And in New Brunswick, a thousand years since the last one, a crowd left speechless. What, what, what does it look like? Uh, look like a... <laughs> it's a, a, an eclipse. It looks like the third rock <laughs> on the moon. Yeah. But above all, it was a moment to savor the moment. This really, I hope, gives us all pause as we ponder what I like to call our place in space, our relationship to the cosmos. A chance in darkness to see the world in a new light. Anand Ram, CBC News, Toronto. The Dead Ice Road will close tomorrow morning. The road across Yellowknife Bay is a wintertime shortcut to the Yellowknife's Dene community. It looks really soggy right there. The closure is about a week earlier than the average. This has been one of the shortest seasons on record for the road. It opened in late January, a month later than the average opening date. The road officially closes at 10 a.m. And that is North Beat for tonight. For news anytime, you can always go to our website, cbc.ca slash north. We leave you with another look at tunic time in Iqaluit. Thank you for watching. I'm Megan Roberts. Have a good night. Is the master of marketing. So handsome, both of them. How big is my face? Bigger. That's a superstar wherever he goes. Two, one, one. two, back. two. Yeah. Daddy marketing works. Her particular skill set can be helpful to us. She's a con artist. I need to get off that boat and back to being a full time detective. And you need to stay out of prison. The best way we do that is to keep our heads down and do as we're told. Sound on pause. If it ain't the any, give me crown on rocks. Ah!